Alright, with bookmark in hand, let's get back to exploring these rooms. So it looks like we've caught yes, shower curtain and two of the plates. Let me go investigate this bathroom. If we recall correctly, it's a wall covered, it's one question else. Uh, we will remember that this bathroom is missing a shower curtain. So why don't we hang it up? There's a curtain rod running above the ceiling. Let's put that shower curtain on those hooks. Let's try spreading the curtains. Ah. Wow, that's a uh, pretty obvious people. Somebody's really dedicated. Well, with a hole this big, you gotta wonder if maybe they wanted to be caught. So you're saying the one getting spied on was into that shit? Uh, maybe they were into, like, those home invasion fantasies. Home invasion? Interesting, I see. You two are real idiots, you know that? Mm. <laughs> Lewis is, like, keeping it real. Let's try spraying the curtains again. Ooh, and now, there's a hole in the curtain. If I look at it from a ways back, I can see a single tile. Alright, from here I can see what tile it is. It looks like it's 5th from the top and 3rd from the right. Uh, oops. That'd be this one. But it doesn't look like uh, there's anything to do here. Nothing strange. The thing's not budging. Hmm, well then that means... Yes, it's a clue to use somewhere else. What's up? You're going back already? Well, I can't just leave June there by herself. Hmm. What, you think you're her knight or her protector or something? You're creeping me out. Whatever, man. I'm going. And we're going to the bathroom, as it were. And if we look at the fifth tile down, a third from the edge... Here it is! Yes, this one's loose! I think I can get under this with my nails and... Yeah! That makes three. Oh. And if you recall the puzzle in the other room, there are only three missing. So you see we have a full picture here. The exit! Lotus and Santa are in the room on the other side. I'm gonna go check up on them. And here, three missing. Let's fill it in. There's a tile in the frame, so I guess I'm supposed to put the tiles in the empty spaces. Alright, I'm gonna give it a shot. Let's see... That was easy. Yes! I did it! There, picture complete. And there goes the frame. Ooh, what's this? What do you mean, what's this? Pretty obvious, isn't it? It's a hole in the wall. Like a hidden safe or something, you know? Anyway, let's take a look. I think there's something inside. The Mars key. Ah, we need that to get out the door that's right outside here. Junpei messed around a bit with the key he had and looked blankly at the picture that slid down. What's the deal with this picture, anyway? Santa had only been mumbling to himself, but it drew Lotus's attention. She looked at the picture and paused. I... I think I've seen this picture before. Where? In a book. There's a British biochemist named Sheldrake. He has a rather interesting theory. I saw this picture in his book. What's this interesting theory? Morphogenic field which relies on the theory of morphic resonance. Man, I can't deal with this. Just listening to you talk about it is giving me a headache. Santa put his hands on his head, as though he actually were in great pain. Lotus merely arched an eyebrow in his direction and continued. It's not a difficult concept to grasp. In essence, he states that the shapes of living organisms and their behavioral patterns are transmitted through a field not visible to the eye. Uh, what part of that isn't difficult, exactly? Lotus did not look pleased. All right, how about this? Theory of the telepathic mechanism. Telepathy? Yes, telepathy. Well, perhaps not exactly telepathy, but it's close enough for a simple approximation. Santa suddenly burst into laughter. <laughs> are you serious? Telepathy? What do you think we are, kids from the 70s? I can't believe someone would actually do serious research on something like that. Yes, I agree. Lotus's response was surprisingly curt. Junpei had expected at least some conflict. I read the book, and I can hardly say I understood it. I'm in no position to defend or condemn anything it said. It was probably just someone latching on to a statistical outlier from some study and turning it into a ridiculous theory. There's no scientific merit to any of it, I'm sure. But even so, I... 
Anyway, I saw a picture like that one in his book. Lotus indicated the picture they'd all been looking at. After a moment, she walked up to the strange picture, examined it, and then spoke. Hey, what do you think this picture looks like? Santa answered first. What do you mean? Isn't it just, like, abstract or something like that? Isn't it just black and white scribbles? There's no meaning there. That's it. What about you, Junpei? Does it look like anything to you? Hmm. I guess it looks like... What do you guys see? Because the first time I played this game, I... I had no idea. I read every single one of these and was like, uh, I guess I could make myself see it. But I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's from having played it before and having seen it in a previous playthrough. Uh, now the image immediately appears. It, the answer seems obvious, as though I already knew it. But it's, uh... Actually, I'm, think, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking it's a man's face. That's probably the most common answer people would say. People tend to see faces because that's what our human brain recognizes. And it's designed to see faces, even uh, as a, as a back, it sort of backfires sometimes into us seeing faces where there actually are none. Uh, a man's face? This is the head, and this is the nose and the mouth. Jump by pointed to what he was talking about. Nope. That's wrong. Lotus smiled triumphantly. It's a dog. See, like this. Lotus pointed out parts of the picture, and eventually a dog took shape in them. It looked as though she had a point. Clearly a dog. Santa also nodded in agreement. So, now we know what it's a picture of, but I don't see how that helps us. Lotus nodded and began to speak. A TV show from Great Britain did an experiment once. They took two similar pictures. Both of them were difficult to identify initially, but once you'd figured out the answer, you couldn't see it as anything else. The first picture was a woman wearing a hat. The other one, well, to make it easier... Let's just say it was this picture of a dog. So, their experiment... First, they sent the pictures to other parts of the world where British radio and television didn't reach. To Ireland, the US, Africa, Europe, etc. Then, in each country, they gathered a number of test subjects. All in all, there were roughly a thousand people. Those 1,000 people were shown the two pictures and asked, What does this picture look like to you? The results, in and of themselves, were not terribly interesting. 9.2% of the people saw the lady in the lady picture. 3.9% saw the dog in the dog picture. Then, two days later, they broadcast a new show. During the 30-minute show, they broadcast the dog picture and its solution. The audience was estimated to be 200,000 people. After the broadcast, it could be assumed that the number of people who knew the solution to the dog picture now totaled over 200,000 people. After another two days had passed, they gathered a number of research subjects from areas where British TV and radio did not exist. This time, they were only able to find a sample of roughly 850 people. Naturally, none of them were the people who had participated in the first test. They were, however, given the same test and the same two pictures. The results were shocking. 10% of the people saw the lady in the lady picture. The previous test had yielded a 9.2% success rate. The change was not statistically significant. The dog picture, however, produced a very different result. The percentage of people able to successfully find the dog grew from 3.9 to 6.8, a very significant increase. So, do you understand? Do you realize the significance of this experiment? There was no way the second group could have seen the picture. They lived far away from Britain and couldn't have seen the picture. But even so, it was only the success rate for the dog picture that went up. Why? How did that happen? What does it mean? Lotus looked back and forth, from Junpei to Santa and back again. Normally calm and collected, she looked now as though she were very nearly possessed, and there was something manic about her manner. Santa took an involuntary step backward. Junpei didn't budge and stared straight back into Lotus's eyes. Does this have something to do with that field or whatever it was that you were talking about earlier? A field not visible to the eye? So if more people know the answer, then that information will pass through the field? Psych! Her manner suddenly shifted, and Lotus smiled broadly at Junpei and Santa. She waved her hand dismissively, doing her best to laugh the whole confrontation off. Oh, I was just kidding. You really shouldn't take me seriously. Well, I mean, the things I just told you were, were about were all true. They really did happen. But the results of that experiment really aren't anything to go by. They could have easily falsified them. In the end, I'm sure they're just in it for the ratings. They are a TV station, after all. 
At last, it seemed that Santa had gained control of his composure. Right. Man, I gotta admit, you had me there for a minute. I, uh, I really thought you were serious. <laughs> of course not. Like I told you before, I'm sure it's all just pseudoscience. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Santa and Lotus laughed and gave one another jovial claps on the shoulder. Junpei, however, didn't feel so much like laughing. Something felt wrong. Unclear. Alright, enough nonsense. We've got the key. Let's get out of here. Word. Did he just really un unironically say word? I know this game's ten years old, but I just can't, remember. can't let that go by without saying something. Lotus and Santa walked away from the picture, but Junpei stayed, staring at the picture of the dog. A field not visible to the naked eye. Morphogenic field. The more he thought about it, the more his head hurt. I love the I love the stuff that this game gets into. They start they start spitballing weird theories at you. All right, let's go to the hallway. I'll go get June. You guys head off to the door. Okay, Roger that. These are the doors we couldn't open earlier. Yes, it unlocked. Good job, Junpei. Good. Now we can get going. Come on, what are you guys standing around for? Let's get out of here. Come on, Jumpy, let's go! Alright, let's go. Thus completes the puzzle behind door four. They stepped through the door to find themselves in a wide hallway. Junpei, June, Lotus, and Santa stopped for a moment and looked at their surroundings. A short distance away, a metal grate extended across the width of the hallway. They took hold and shook, but it refused to move. Nearby was a pair of elevators. It only took a few button pressures to determine that the elevators would not respond to their efforts. They could only assume the elevators were not powered. There was only one door left. Well, looks like we wouldn't have any choice. Yeah, sure does. Well then, let's open it. Junpei grabbed a hold of the knob and quietly pushed the door open. He entered, slowly, trying to take in as much of his surroundings as he could. The others followed shortly. So, it's a kitchen. Santa did not look pleased. What were you expecting? Isn't it obvious? The exit. I was hoping this would be the way out of here. <laughs> you really think it'd be that easy? Yeah, yeah, I know, still. As they talked, Lotus headed deeper into the room. Until at last, she stood in front of a door. If we can just get through this door, we should come out on the other side of that grate we saw earlier. But don't we need a key for that? Sorry, I guess that wasn't very constructive. Neither Junpei nor Lotus looked terribly happy. Junpei dug the ship map from his pocket and spread it out in front of him. As he did... Hey! What's that? Huh? Oh, yeah, I guess I forgot to tell you. I found this a little while ago. It's a map of the beat. Before Junpei could finish, Lotus snatched the map away from him. She ran her finger across it, muttering to herself, I knew it. See, look. Junpei did as he was told. Santa and June moved over to look at the map as well. See? We came in here. If we go out there, then we'll be on the other side of the grate. With her finger, Lotus traced a path on the map. Ding -dong. She was right. Satisfied that she had been correct, Lotus folded the map and handed it back to Junpei. He took it and slid the valuable piece of paper back into his pocket. There's a card reader on the right side of the door. Then that means the key card is somewhere in here, right? That seems the most likely. All right, we know what we need to do then. Let's get moving. First off, I say we split up and look for clues. <laughs> okay, gang! <laughs> Take it easy, Fred. Okay! Fooled ya! There's actually two puzzles behind this door. Welcome to the kitchen. This is the first, um... Well, well, let's just get into it. I won't spoil what the puzzle's about until we find the puzzle. What's this? A voucher, it says. Appetizer 9, meat dish 10, soup A, seafood dish F. What is this? There's nine plates that look pretty expensive. They're plates for appetizers. Remember, appetizers usually come on square plates. Oh, okay, okay. Well, excuse me, princess. Man, 
We had a Scooby-Doo reference and a Zelda reference within a minute of each other. This game is going wild with the references right now. One, two, three, there's ten of them. If you flip these over, they look like hats. The middle is super deep for a plate. They're soup plates. They're made that way so the soup doesn't spill. If we ever get out of here, you should treat yourself to a nice dinner out. What makes you think a poor college student has the money to do something like that? I think there are 15 of these plates. I'm assuming they're for seafood. How the hell can you tell that? They look just like any other plate from a 99 cent store. If you ever take a lady out to dinner, you're going to embarrass yourself. I feel sorry for June. But what? Why the hell are you bringing up June? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. You're not terribly subtle. Oops, and that's just a bar. <laughs> this looks like a serving table. Thank you. I would imagine food is put here after it's prepared so that the waiters and waitresses can take it out to the customers. But something doesn't seem right here. Why are there so many plates? There's a bunch of little wavy ridges on this plate. Those plates are for serving meat. Ugh, you really are ignorant, aren't you? Come on, it's not like I need to know this crap. Jeez. Hmm. So... There's a voucher at the end of the counter. This voucher doesn't match the number of plates on the table. It says, Appetizer 9, Meat Dish 10, Soup A, Seafood Dish F on the voucher. And the plates on the table are... 9 appetizers, 16 meat, 10 soup, 15 seafood. Maybe they're using the hexadecimal here. And hexadecimal is... It's a number system that goes 8, 9, A, B, C, D, F, 10, 11. You're familiar with base 10, right? That's the normal system numbers. Uh, the base 10 equivalent for hexadecimal numbers would go like this. Well, A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, D is 13, E is 14, and F is 15. And then after that, you go back to 10. The 10 becomes 16 in base 10. I know it sounds strange, but you can think of it just as six letters added onto the normal number system after 9. There it is again for you. And so on. I think I get it. Oh, that last part was supposed to be Junpei. Yeah, so you can see where it says, like, seafood dish F. That means, uh... Okay, where was the seafood place? Yeah, so, there you go. That is... <laughs> 16 is written as 10 in hexadecimal. That is nuts! <laughs> yeah, so this is your first hexadecimal puzzle in this game. Wow! This pot looks like it's made out of silver. I bet drinking tea from this pot would be really yummy. Spending a day off with June, drinking tea... Could such a day ever happen for me? Jumpy? Uh, oh, nothing. We don't really need the hot water, so we should probably be moving on. I think this is where we came... Oh no, this is, a, this is not where we came in, <laughs> this is the pantry. And there's some stuff over here. There's so much stuff in here! A whole lot of cans! This is probably a pantry. <laughs> Most likely! There's a box here. Ah. A rusty knife. I don't think we'll be able to use it while it's like this. The knife seemed important. Jumpei thought, but it wasn't going to be much use the way it was. It's futile. Futile? You know, a waste, useless, pointless. Oh, um, any particular reason you wanted to bring that up? Oh, no reason, really. I was just thinking about futility. She wasn't making much sense. Jumpei tried rephrasing his question. Why were you thinking about futility? At last she answered. Well, it has something to do with the Titanic. The Titanic? Yep. Have you ever heard the story that the sinking of the Titanic was predicted? Uh... No. I haven't. What is it? In 1892, 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novel was published. It was called Futility. It was written by an American novelist named Morgan Robertson. The story was about a big cruise ship colliding with an iceberg and sinking. Of course, that was, if that was the only similarity, similarity, there wouldn't be any reason to mention it. It wasn't, though. The name of the ship, its nationality, course, departure time, size, displacement, maximum speed, number of passengers and crew, the number of lifeboats, even the location of the accident itself, and the cause, and the location of the damage. Everything matches the Titanic almost exactly. It was almost as if he'd seen the whole thing happen. But this book was written 14 years before the Titanic sank. Hmm. But that's not all. It wasn't just futility that predicted the sinking of the Titanic. There were two other similar stories written by a man named William Thomas Stead, both of them before the accident. One in 1886 and one in 1892. 
Stad wrote two stories that had striking similarities to the Titanic disaster. In one, two ships collided and many of the passengers died because there weren't enough lifeboats. In the other, a ship collided with an iceberg and sank. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'll give you that. It seems a little weird, but... I'm pretty sure it wasn't too uncommon for ships to hit icebergs back in the day, or even other ships. Right. I, I knew you'd say that. Hmm? But what if Stead had some sort of special powers? To be more specific, what if he had the ability to do automatic writing? What? Automatic writing? Wait, are you... Are you talking about that thing where someone says they're possessed by a spirit, and then they write a bunch of stuff without knowing what they're writing? Yes. What do you mean, yes? That stuff's a load of bull. But, Jumpy, you said you believe in curses. Come on, that's totally different. Okay, so let's say hypothetically that automatic writing isn't a total load. These guys still couldn't have predicted the sinking of the Titanic. When this dead dude wrote his thing, nobody had died on the Titanic yet. So if automatic writing is about being possessed by spirits of dead people, who the hell possessed him so that he could write that stuff? That's not it. What's not it? Stead wasn't possessed by a spirit. He was doing the possessing. Um... What are you smoking? William Thomas Stead was a passenger on the Titanic. He just wrote down what he saw with his own eyes, 20 years before it happened. Uh... He decided it was probably best to say nothing. What June was saying was insane and utterly absurd. If he tried to take what she was saying seriously, he'd go mad. Junpei smiled uncomfortably. Well, uh... Why don't we talk about this some other time, okay? Huh? But... Uh... Her voice trailed off and she glanced at the floor, troubled. Tap, tap. Junpei tapped June gently on the shoulder and awkwardly reached around to pick up the knife from the box. It's a rusty knife! Not much use at this point. I guess this is a video game and you can't use a rusty knife until it's a sharp knife, right? There are a number of cheeses lined up on the shelf. This is Gouda cheese! The most famous Dutch cheese. If you don't cut up in the casing, it usually won't go bad. So you can store it at room temperature for quite a while. So we can eat this? Most likely. Um, I'm not hungry, at all. I guess it's hard to get hungry in a situation like this. Hey, there's something behind the cheese! You're right! Why don't we move some of the cheese? <laughs> Say cheese again. I double dare you, motherfucker. Say cheese one more goddamn time. There's a little green bottle back there. A bottle of... oil. Okay, like all of them. Oh look, cooking oil! You could probably use this to make something slippery. Or to cook something with. If only we needed to make hot, slippery cheese. I wonder if that was the answer to a puzzle here. Hot, slippery cheese. Let's see. Let's get some angles here. We have a grill. Alright, it's going. I think this was all part of Zero's plan. Probably. Kinda hard to believe there's a chef on board somewhere. Fair enough. I wonder what this drawer is. You see the metal grate on the top of the grill? They make it like that so the fat and juices can drip off the meat while it cooks. Okay, so it's like a fat drawer. Maybe this table's preparing food. There are plates everywhere. There's a sink here. A sink. It's still got water in it. There's a couple of plates in there, but I don't think they're going to help as much. And... Oh! It's a whetstone. We know what to do with that. Whetstones are for sharpening things. Maybe I'll use the whetstone to sharpen the knife. The blade of the knife is getting sharper by the second. I should be able to cut something pretty good with this. Uh-oh. Danger, Will Robertson. <laughs> Robertson or Robinson? Robinson, I think. Anyway. We have some garbage cans in here. A trash can. There's nothing inside of it. Well, better than being full of rotten food, I suppose. Oh, a countertop. There's a rolling pin and a colander here. Nothing useful. I think I have that rolling pin in Fallout 4. What is this? An iron oven. Looks pretty heavy duty. It's probably industrial quality. I bet you could cook anything with this. Anyway, let's have a look inside. Damn, I knew it. It's locked. Probably by this thing, yeah. I'm not gonna click on it because it's only gonna say the obvious. I'm trying to go all the way around here. How do I? Yeah, this confused me for a while. To get over to this door, this is the only angle you can see it from. So you just click on it from here and, like, leap over this counter, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, let's, uh, go inside. A door! There's a bolt keeping us from opening it. Well, let's open the bolt. It's a bolt. And it's really rusty. Will this even open? We won't know until we try. Let's give it a shot. Alright, 
Let's see if you're gonna come out. Damn. No dice. I don't want to make it a little slippery. I suppose it's rusted in place. It won't budge. Of course! Maybe if I put some oil on it. Hey, hey! Just a little bit of oil and... Come on, come on, you little son of a bitch. Whoa! Yes, got you, you little bastard. You did it, Dumpy. You're so smart. And here I thought the cooking oil was only good for cooking. As Junpei walked into the room, a blast of cold air washed over him. Almost instinctively, he folded his arms tight across his chest, doing what he could to conserve body heat. Ugh, it's cold in here. What is this place? Are you blind? It's a freezer! Saying his teeth had already meant to chatter. I'm not going to try and uh, impersonate that. Hardly surprising. The freezer was far too cold for someone dressed as he was. Lotus, however, was even in an even worse situation. Oh, no way! That's way too cold for me! I'll freeze solid in seconds. Sorry, but I'm afraid I have to pass on this one. I'm gonna leave the rest of you. And with that, she ran out of the room. As Lotus left, June came in. Whoa, it's really cold in here. White puffs of steam hovered in front of their faces as they talked. June had already started to shiver. Hey, you don't need to be in here. You had a fever just a little while ago. You should stay outside, we got this. No, I'm fine. My fever's gone now, but... Junpei had scarcely opened his mouth. When the thunderous sound of metal upon metal rang out from behind them. In unison, they spun around to find that the door they had only recently come through was closed. Junpei rushed to the door. Desperately, he grabbed hold of the doorknob. Ow! It was cold, beyond cold. Nearly touching it was painful. The doorknob had been frozen solid. They quickly deduced that the pipe next to the door had ruptured. Water released by the rupture had hit the door and frozen instantly. Santa shoved Dempe aside and pounded against the door. Hey, Lotus! You're out there, right? Open the door! She wasted no time in responding. What do you want? What's going on? The door won't open. Try opening it from that side. Please. Uh, fine. If you say so. Hold on. Soon they could hear Lotus on the other side of the door. Then the grunting ceased, and they could hear light panting as if from exertion. It's no use. It won't budge. You've got more people in there. You figure it out. God damn it. Santa was shaking like a newborn deer. June was hugging herself and was shivering violently. Even Junpei, with the heaviest clothes of any of them, was clearly feeling the cold. With every breath they took, they could feel the cold working its way deeper and deeper into their bodies. Anyway, let's find a way out. If we don't get moving, we're gonna end up with permanent residents. I'm not. I'm not gonna keep shivering. It's too hard. Two, two heads are better than. Two heads are better than none. I'm sure we'll figure something out. Y yeah, you're right. Let's just take a good look around this room, okay? Right. They pushed in close to one another and began to search.